So we're very happy to have everybody playing uh, St. Martin Griffin from the University of Cambridge. I knew him for many years when he was a friend of us many years ago, and then I was very happy to run with him again in the Cambridge about a year and a half ago, the workshop that we, I was visiting. So he um, went to Red Labs until about 2005, and then he moved to the Philip Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. He's going to be here until November 10th. And he's going to be in room 2251. Yes. Uh, that's where the place is. It's about two doors down from mine and next to San. So uh, and he'll be aware of the talks and so on and so forth. So we'll make more announcements uh, about anything that you may want to come into. The round table for, it's not going to be today because of the schedule, it's going to be Tuesday uh, on November 1 at uh, 2 p.m. in the same room as here. Uh, at two, two, 2 o'clock. And then he's giving another lecture on November 7, Monday, on the model based system engineering project on the algebraic side of the model that he uses. Okay? And that's going to be on the 11th of the job in the morning. Okay? And then we'll probably schedule some informal talks during, uh, by him during this week and the time that he's here on the mathematics and the methods behind some of these formulas. The idea being is to try to produce people that some of the more formal ways of treating protocols and systems that uh, he has been working on and I have been working on a few other people. Okay, so that's the plan and uh, try to get in touch with us as things evolve over these 10 days. So today he's going to talk about what have we learned from reverse engineering the internet's inter-domain routing protocol. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Um, First of all, I'd like to say that this is going to be a, a kind of a summary talk of, of some work that uh, I've been involved with for 10 years, and I'll try to mention you know, people I've worked with along the way. Uh, so many people have contributed to this. Um, the other thing is, I'm sort of assuming you are engineers of various types, or mathematicians, or computer scientists, uh, and you probably are not interested in each Okay, uh, in, in you know just this this you know how does Sprint and AT and T and 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 British Telecom how do they exchange internet routes? You probably aren't interested in the details, and that's okay because I'm not going to enter into the details. I, I want to present what we've learned in a way that maybe you can reuse in the work that you're doing. So I want to make it general enough that uh, we don't get mired in the in the uh, in the domain specific details. Although I'll, I'll give you an idea of how this work came out of those details, but uh, but uh, so what? So we have a question here. What have we learned? And I want to answer it on the first slide. But first, I want to say something. This is about using algebraic methods, uh, so think semi rings, to find paths in graphs. Okay, so we all know about shortest paths and in, in, in finding shortest paths in a graph and. Algorithms like Dijkstra's algorithm, Bellman Ford, Marshall's algorithm, um, and and essentially the algebraic approach, which I'll which I'll discuss. By the way, if this slide doesn't make any sense to you, it will by the end of the talk because I will have explained everything. Uh, but uh, the thing is, the algebraic approach generalizes that uh, to other structures other than just the min plus that we're used to with uh, shortest paths. Now, the thing about it is. There are many models of, of routing in networks. And for example, the, the bellheads, the telcos, used opti essentially combinatorial optimization because routing in that domain routes around congestion. Okay? That is not the case in the internet. This is really important for why our, uh, why our algebraic approach is useful at all here. Well, it's because you don't route around congestion in the internet. In other words, you, you network operators configure networks, and and uh, the traffic itself is elastic because of things like TCP uh, and various things. And in the past, people have learned that that if you try to route around congestion in the internet, you will just cause oscillation in the network because the control loop is much slower than the, than the actual you know the congestion events come and go very fast. So basically. That's why we can use an algebraic approach here. We don't route around congestion. So, of course, you have to design the, the weights in your network, right? But those are done sort of, that, that's done at network management time scales, meaning weeks and months, 
It's not done dynamically by the protocol. Okay. So we have this whole literature, and I'll talk about some references in a minute about using a generalizations of shortest paths. And it's always been focused on what I'll call global optimality. In other words, you look for the best possible paths over, overall. You look at all paths and you find the best ones. Okay. And of course, we could always enumerate all paths and find the best ones, but we have some uh, tractable <coughs> means of uh, uh, doing it because the, uh, most of the time we have nice properties in our algebras that allow us to find very quickly uh, global optimal. Uh, but there is another notion that, that is not mentioned in the literature so much of, of algebraic path problems, and that is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, you get the best paths you can get given what your neighbors have. So it's kind of an equilibrium. Uh, of some kind. And cla the reason we don't see this distinction a lot is classically, if you look at the classic literature on it, which I'll discuss, these two notions coincide. coincide. Global equals local, everything happy, happy, happy. So, but here's what I want you to take away. That there are some, and notice I put some here. Right? I'm, not, I'm not claiming this, is, uh, this works in all cases, but in, in a significant uh, subclass of problems, there are algebraic uh, path problems that admit local, unique local solutions that are different from the global solutions. Okay. And uh, not only that, but these local optima, I'll call them, represent meaningful solutions in the, in the thing we're trying to model. Okay. Maybe even more meaningful than a globally optimal set of paths. Yeah. No. So what I mean by a local optima is, uh, is you know, I, I have these paths. They're the best ones I can get given what my neighbors have. But, you know, maybe there are paths I can't see. They're hidden from me. I would really like them if I could see them. Those are the globally optimal paths. But I can't see them. So, so the notion depends on the information structure. You could, well, you could look at it that way, but it's more, I'll, I'll just define it. You'll see how I define it in a bit. You know, this is a little bit informal, just to give you an idea of where we're going. But it is, it is based on uh, the logical idea that if my neighbors have, have local resource paths to some destination, I want to use that to compose right. local, local paths from what the neighbors know. Yeah. So it's not exactly the So you're probably familiar with the, the classical theory talks about um, essentially this closure operation as the way of finding global optima, which also solves the matrix equation. But now you could have a solution to the matrix equation that is not uh, a closure, uh, the result of a closure. So. Okay, so uh, the thing is, and, and kind of a surprising thing, because uh, for these algebras we'll see, um, this, that we can actually solve some of these problems in polynomial time, which is kind of surprising. Okay, that's where we're going. Okay, and uh, that's what I want you to take away. You may come, if you're doing algebraic modeling of some sort, you may come across these problems that, that you can't model in, in the traditional framework. And then hopefully now you, have, you might have another tool in your toolbox. Okay, ah, maybe local optima are the thing you need. Okay, so that's what we've learned, I think, from in 10 years of looking at interdomain routing. Of course, we've learned a lot of domain-specific things, but we don't care about those because we don't run an ISP. Okay, so just a very uh, quick review of, uh, of uh, pathfinding al using algebras. Now, some of you may have seen this before, but I'm going to go through it because maybe it's, it's new to you. Um, here I have a graph, and I've assumed that the, it's a directed graph with the arcs labeled the same in each direction. They have integer weights, and here I have an adjacency matrix. And what I want to do is I want to find, uh, according to those arc weights, I want to find the shortest paths. Uh, essentially, the all pairs shortest. I want to solve the all pairs shortest path problem. And here's uh, uh, the solution, usually called A star for various reasons. and um, 
This solves a, a, what I'll call a globally optimal problem because the entry uh, ij is the min over all paths from i to j, even paths with loops in them, uh, of the weight of the path. And the weight here is uh, just the sum of the arc weights. And uh, notice I, I'm, I'm uh, using these two operations, min and plus. Those are the, the two operations associated with this shortest path algebra. OK. And um, it turns out that we can uh, generalize. And this was probably uh, people started noticing this in the late 60s, early 70s, mostly in the operations research community. People said, hey, wait a minute. You know Dijkstra's algorithm works for many structures. Uh, and here's another example, max min. So you can think of this as bandwidth. You want the highest bandwidth, max is the way you compare things. And min, you take, what is the, ba what is the bandwidth of a path? Well, it's the, it's the bandwidth of the bottleneck, bottleneck link. So min is the right operation to use along the path rather than plus. Uh, so this one, I've uh, used the same weights here. And this one solves the all pair shortest path problem with a maximum over uh, the weight of the path. And now the weight is a, is a minimum of the arc weight. Okay, and uh, we can we can do this with other structures as well. Here's an interesting one. Uh, this one, this kind of thing, we don't see so much in network uh, routing, but you could uh, use this kind of thing. So, for example, I've used uh, union and intersection with a finite set here, and uh, of of labels on arcs. And so the idea is that. Uh, in this uh, global optima, uh, I did over a union of all of the path weights, uh, and the path weights are essentially the intersections of all the edge weights. So if x is uh, in ABC and it's in uh, the weight of the path from I to J, then that means there's at least one path from I to J where every arc has x as a label. So what, what's, in it, what's different about, what's really different about these things is, notice max here is my thing for comparison, and min was my operation for comparison uh, before. Those things have a total order associated with them. But this, this uh, union doesn't. It actually uh, has a partial order associated with it. And that partial order could either be containment or, or, or uh, a sub, a sub, a subset containment or superset uh, containment, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, but uh, that's interesting. And, and so the, the operations research community, for example, uh, discovered things like you can use Dijkstra here and Bellman Ford, generalizations of Bellman Ford and generalizations of Warshall's algorithm. But for this guy, because you don't have a total order, it's only a partial order, you can't use Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, you, but you can use generalizations of Bellman Ford, etc. Okay. So that means there's no principle of optimality. No, there is a principle of optimality if you take that equation as an optimal. I'm saying that over all possible paths, I'm going to find you the best path, but the best path is with respect to that first operation. So we, in this case, I'm, it's a partial order. Uh, so it's. Uh, is it No, the thing is, you can when when you when you have a total order, you can draw trees like this. You know, here's the the, the path from one to every other uh, node in the graph. When you have a, a when you don't have a total order, you can't really draw. That's why there's no dark arrows on this on this graph. There's you know multiple paths that are incomparable can contribute to the to the result. It's a little bit more difficult to talk about the path. With, Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, more yeah. questions. So, um, if you're trying to say find a path from one to five with a given better quality of service, right? yeah. so, um, could you use something like this to say what are my quality of service settings I could, yeah. I could use? It'll actually make it through the whole network because that's one of the problems right. with. Yeah. Actually, this is yeah, the thing is okay. So one of the things I want to say, and this is something that will resonate with uh, some of the work that John has done, is that 
that the, the sort of traditional, right now, that the mainstream networking people don't know much about this stuff. Okay. So, and there are historical reasons for that. So the, 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 route, the routing theory that was developed in networking tended to come out of the, the, the Bell sort of system <coughs> of telcos, and that was combinatorial optimization. Okay. So, and uh, they didn't know much about this stuff either. Um, this stuff is, is tended to be in the uh, operations research, well known in the operations research community and some other communities, but not well known in the internet community. And even if you go to, and I've spent some time at both Juniper and Cisco talking to the people who implement uh, a lot of the routing protocols for the internet, uh, the internet routing protocols, they don't know this stuff either. They don't really know routing theory. They know, they're really good at implementing efficiently routing protocols, but they tend not to understand the sort of network-wide behavior of these protocols. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, so, so the thing is that I believe this kind of formalism is, is a gold mine for, uh, let's say, especially thinking about new protocols uh, for data networks, uh, and it hasn't been very much exploited in that, by that. Yeah, so you start looking at this stuff and you see all sorts of interesting things you can do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to run past that really quick. So I've just listed a few semi-rings here, and um, the standard notation is for the thing that selects paths to use a plus, and for the operation along a path to use a, a times. That's because semi-rings are a generalization of a ring, and the most common ring that we all know is uh, the real numbers with plus and times, right? And it turns out really interesting that a lot of the algorithms, like Nystrom's algorithm, like Bell and Ford, like Warshall's, they have analogs in linear algebra. And once you see that, it's sort of like, oh my god, you know. In other words, you have a, there, if you look at uh, Gaussian elimination, it's it's essentially uh, so. But in a in a more general setting, right? In the semi ring. And the thing that makes these things semi rings and not rings is this. That this addition doesn't have inverses. Okay. I mean, it could have an inverse, but it turns out that in our world, in this pathfinding world, if it does have an inverse, it's probably not interesting. Uh, because then the order is tricky. Okay. So uh, the fact that it doesn't have an order makes, uh, I'm sorry, an inverse makes the order interesting uh, on these structures. And here are just a few of them, and there are many more. And again, this is the notion of optimality that we're dealing with. Very simple notion that I take essentially the plus best path weights over all possible paths. Now you can you you can do a lot with these things, and I'm going to refer to two books. Um, so the first one is uh, Gondran and Minot. This is a it comes out of the operations research community. This was published in English in 2008, and it's kind of a survey of the last 40 years. I'll call this the encyclopedia. It's, it's really uh, quite a dense book and, uh, and quite a useful reference book, uh, but it doesn't, have a, it doesn't mention networks once, I think. All of the motivation comes from operations research, scheduling problems, uh, distribution problems, things like that. Or all, I, I should say, semi-rings are used also not just to find paths and graphs, but they, they have other applications like uh, studying discrete event systems. And this book does cover that as well. So now I'm not putting this book up here just because I'm here at UMD. I actually, as soon as this thing was published in January of, I think, 2010, I started uh, trying to get networking people to read it because there's, the, the, like I said, the networking community doesn't know about this stuff. And I, I think this book fills a really, uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a very nice uh, gap. Uh, it's sort of looking at this semi-ring stuff, but trying to explain it to networking people and to make it relevant to networking and examples from networking. John, is there anything you'd like to add? It's also very short. It's very short. It's, yes. <laughs> and uh, I'll refer, okay, so here's the encyclopedia and then I'll call this John's book. Okay. So it's very readable. Oh, sure, it doesn't mean readable. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I, I want to just, I think for a moment, I, I talked about this 
global optimality. And of course, I, I'm not telling you all of the axioms that semi rings have to satisfy, and the additional uh, axioms that, that imply that, uh, or axioms, condition, let's say sufficient conditions that imply that you can compute A star. Uh, then there are more conditions you need to compute A star efficiently, and so on. I'm not going to talk about all that. I'm just going to talk about what breaks in almost every internet protocol we look at. Okay, and it's essentially these two distributivity rules. Okay, so let's just look at the first one, and let's think about it in terms of, of routing. And I can think of my neighbor gave it has two routes, one with weight B and one with weight C. Okay, and think of that plus as my my neighbor is making a decision, which one? Okay, and, and then I'm applying my policy to my neighbor. That's what that is. And distributivity says it's the same as if my neighbor didn't make the decision. My neighbor says, okay, I'll pass both routes. You, you make the decision. Okay. And distributivity says they're the same. Okay. And I have, I have yet to find an internet protocol. Okay, RIP, I think, is the only exception that actually satisfies this. Even the ones that the community think, they say, oh, it's the shortest path. OSPF, shortest path. ISIS, shortest path. It's not true. You look at the details, and you find hiding in the algorithms and in the, in the RFCs, you find things that you go, oh no, they're not shortest path protocols. Uh, they're doing more, and as a matter of fact, their metrics violate these distributivity axes. Well, that's kind of interesting. And so the really interesting thing is this is the interdomain routing protocol that runs the internet violates. So typically what we have, if we think of lower cost is better, minimizing is better, then typically what we have is, um, uh, let's see, is this thing is usually better than that thing. In, in other words, uh, your, the, the decisions that your neighbor makes can disappoint you. Your neighbor is hiding things from you that you'd really like to get your hands on, but they're making the decision. Okay, so when I started looking at this 10 years ago, when I was at Bell Labs and I started working with Gordon Wilfong and, and uh, Bruce Shepard, we didn't, we didn't use the algebraic approach at all because we knew, you know, we knew about the algebraic approach and it seems so fundamentally, if you look at Gondran and Minot's book, I mean, these distributivity laws are essentially the founding foundation of all the theory. You can't do anything without them in that approach. Okay. Um, and so we didn't use that. We came up with something called the stratified shortest, no, we call it the stable path problem. Yeah. And uh, essentially it was a more of a combinatorial model. It was a graph theoretic model of, of when you can find uh, solutions and, and how you can find solutions to these to these routing problems without um, distributivity. Uh, and later what happened is maybe 2004, 2005, Joan Sobrinu said, hey, let's just start using algebra and live without distributivity. Shocking, right? And uh, so if you talk to a lot of the people in the OR community and that know about this algebraic pro approach, they're, they're a little conservative. They're like, oh, you can't get rid of that. Whatever you do, we need, we need distributivity. Did I say associativity just now? I meant distributivity. We need distributivity. How can you live without it? I mean, one way of looking at it is these semi-rings are already so impoverished. <laughs> right? It's a kind of remarkable you can do anything with a semi-ring. Uh, but and now you want to throw away distributivity. Hmm. Okay, so uh, yes, we do. When it makes sense, right? It might make sense. So here we go. Uh, let's now talk about a different notion. Uh, here, what I'll call it is left local optima. So what I want to do is I want to say uh, L is a left local optima. And there's the uh, adjacency matrix again. And I here is the identity matrix, the multiplicative identity matrix. And now, just as we lift up plus and times from reals to matrices, Right, uh, <coughs> over reals. We can do the same with a semi-ring. 
And if you start with a semi-ring, you'll end up with a semi-ring of matrices. And I'll call that a left local optima because I'm thinking about this is the kind of thing that you see in internet routing protocols. L wants to get to J. How does it do it? It looks at its neighbor, Q. It looks at all of its neighbors, Q. And it says, oh, Q, all you Qs out there, tell me your routes to J. I'll apply my policy to you, and then I'll pick the best one. Okay. Now, in the classical theory, when we have distributivity, it turns out that that solution is essentially the A star that we talked about. Essentially, because there are some details you have to worry about. Um, but uh, essentially, that they're the same notion. Solutions to this equation and that A star. There may be multiple solutions, but typically there aren't. Um, but uh, so anyway, so um, you can think about uh, uh, distributed Bellman Ford, for example, in some internet protocols. You can think about the distributed Bellman Ford as an iterative algorithm to solve this equation. Okay, you just at each stage, you look at what your neighbors have, and you try to build the paths that are consistent with that. And there's and, and if you don't have distributivity, you may be able to solve this. Okay. So uh, think Bellman Ford when you think this thing, and I just want to say that it works well with hop by hop forwarding, which we do have in the internet. But you're not interested in hop by hop forwarding. You're modeling some other problem. So when do you, when is local optima a sensible thing? It, it's sensible when essentially that what do you what are you representing with a path? Right? And is it when you use a path? from I to J, is it sensible to think, oh, it's the only paths I can really use are the ones that extend what my neighbors are using. Okay? So that's when local optimality uh, makes sense. Because you know, with global optimality, you may just ignore all of your neighbors and jump over them and use other paths right? that they're not using. So local optimality, it makes sense when you have that kind of local consistency constraint. On, on you use the problem. A if you have to solve these problems, the yeah. subset and information constraint that you have to A, use information from your neighbors, right. and B, use the same principle. Of, of yes. Which happens not only here, but it happens in control and many other things. Yes. So that's very true. And one of the things that I'm hoping to get out of this visit is we'll find other problems uh, in other domains where this notion of local optimality is, is there. Uh, because if you look at um, if you look at the encyclopedia, also in your in your book, the basic notion is global optimality, even when distributivity doesn't. Right? You try to figure out how do I use the notion of global optimality, global optimality, and all we're saying here is well, you know, in some cases local optimality might be good enough, and it might be exactly what you need. Of course, whenever there's a left something, there's a right something. And here's a right local optima. I just split the multiplication around. And the way I like to think about this one is now I, I'm at i. I want to get to j. How do I do it? Well, I go across the network. And I find all of j's neighbors. And I optimize my paths to j's neighbors. And then I, and then I find the best extension. Okay. So when I think of that kind of thing, I think Dijkstra's algorithm. That's how Dijkstra's algorithm works. It grows a tree starting at i, and it grows a, a greedy, in a greedy fashion, it grows a tree. And note that this doesn't necessarily work well with that local consistency thing, because uh, without distributivity, you could very easily uh, introduce forwarding loops. If, you're, if your notion of uh, using a path is hop by hop forwarding, for example. Okay? So, now, without distributivity, uh, it turns out, well, with distributivity, I should say, first, all of these notions coincide, essentially. You know, modulo some little tacky details. Um, but uh, without, they could, they could all, they might all exist and, and be distinct. Okay. And furthermore, which is, here's kind of something kind of interesting, in general, uh, we, uh, I'll show you that we now, in some cases, know how to compute these guys in polynomial time. 
without distributivity, but we don't know how to compute a star in polynomial time for the same cases. Right? Because it, essentially what you end up doing in the worst case is enumerating all paths. Right? And there are lots of them. Okay? So, um, so what I, one thing I want to mention, just uh, when you take a semi-ring and you lift it up the matrix, you still have a semi-ring. But when you take one of these non-distributive structures and lift it up, you lose associativity of multiplication, which is kind of something you really, you, you go, whoa, what happened there? And it, it turns out that once you get used to that idea, it seems natural. Uh, but maybe I'll try to convince people of that during the next two weeks. Um, but anyway, that's kind of another story. So let me give you an example. And I use this example just because, and there are examples in John's book as well. Uh, there's an example of essentially a shortest path with discounting. Is The idea is this, shortest path, but the further away an arc is from you, the less it counts. Maybe it's the right way to think about it. You know, and with distance, the, the weights kind of disintegrate. Uh, and that's a non-distributed structure. Uh, and, and, and John's book, uh, talks about some techniques that are typically used when people run into these things. And they're called, some operations research people have called them unstructured path problems. Others have called them non-Markovian, I think was the word you used. And what you try to do is you try to embed it in a distributive system, solve it there, and then take that solution back. Uh, and what the problem there is, of course, that the, it, uh, it explodes. That's one of the problems. The other problem is maybe that's not the right solution. Maybe you want the local solution. Anyway, so here we have, remember we have max min, bandwidth, min plus, shortest path. And I'm going to use, the first component here is bandwidth, and the second is path length. And I'm going to do lexicographic choice. So I'm going to first look at bandwidth, and then break ties on the shortest path. Turns out this is not distributed. Uh, and, oh, if you switch the order, <coughs> shortest path first, bandwidth second, it is distributed. Okay? By the way, if you, if you see the talk on the seventh, or talk to me about the system we built, uh, one of the things we do is we try to make it easy to construct new algebras and sort of automate all of that reasoning that goes behind is it distributive or not distributive, is it associative or not, because it's incredibly tedious to do this for complicated structures. And so we have a tool where we've tried to automate most of that. Distinguished means human error prone. Human error prone. And there's all, yes, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> uh, and there are so many variations on essentially the same theorems. Uh, it's hard to keep track of. Anyway, so uh, that's what we want. and, and uh, I just want to show you, okay, it's, uh, there is a global optima, but I'm going to talk about, here's a left local optima. And there's one entry in this example from 3 to 1, that is 5, 7, uh, that is not a uh, globally optimal path. So uh, let's just look at that. Uh, did I say 5 to 7? I meant 5 to 1. No, it's 3 to 1, this path. Is, is not a locally, it's not a globally optimal path, it's a locally optimal path. Uh, because if three were allowed to see everything, uh, what would it have? It would have something bandwidth five and uh, distance two. But in this local optimum. The mistake you make is you read the entries and you read the row and column. I know. Right. I've confused myself. I'm trying to explain what you said. Yeah. Uh, can can so you all do a translation of my confusion? It's a 3 one that you thought but you thought you read about the divider, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, well, go ahead. Sorry. So 5, 7 versus 5, 2. Let's look at that. Uh, 5, 7 we know is this way. Right? Uh, no, that's 5. Oh, now I'm totally confused. <laughs> See, you see what we need to automate? Oh, 5, 2 is the global, and 5, 7 is the local. So here's a left local. Okay, 5, 7. Uh, oh, that's 
one, two, two, five, two, okay. Okay, so let's see if we can figure this out. Um, I see three, two. Okay, let's look at the right local first. Maybe this will help us. Um, made so much sense when I was looking at it this morning. Um, okay, let's see if we can make sense of this. The globally optimal paths, 5, 2, from 3 to 1. Locally optimal is 5, 7. But why do I have, there's the locally optimal. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong here. Sorry. This is illustrating the locally optimal path from 3 to 2. Okay. Okay. And it turns out that the locally optimal path from 3 to 1 is not a subpath of this path. Oh, that's the problem. It goes this way. Okay. It's actually a good example because I was thinking this occurs a lot in interdomain routing. Because our intuitions of routing come from shortest paths. And where subpaths of the shortest paths are themselves shortest paths. That's the principle of routing that I've exactly. asked you. That's not true here. And that's why I just confused myself again. And I saw this happen at AT&T when I was working with the backbone people. Because our intuitions say that, you know, shortest subpaths are the shortest paths are shortest paths. And that's not true here. Uh, this guy's shortest path to three, to two, goes this way. Its shortest path to one goes that way. Is this something related to the isotopicity? That's another way of saying monotonicity or distributivity closely related to distributivity, yes. Okay. Uh, there's another internet protocol where people first noticed this, uh, it's called EIGRP. Has anyone heard of it? Okay, it's Cisco's proprietary protocol. And they have a very complex metric with this protocol. And people re started reporting essentially routing bugs or things that they didn't understand that were closely related to this thing that I just was confused by. Uh, and it turns out that EIGRP does not have distributed metrics. Uh, there's another comment I will make to the question that somebody asked from there is that the very old paper by Poor and Verdue, right? That talks about for what structures, algebraic structures, <coughs> dynamic program holds in everything we know about dynamic program. So there you can see again this notion of distributivity and not, and, and the notion of Bellman's principle. If you lose that one way or the other, you cannot do dynamic program. So it's not yep. just the fact that the cost has to be, uh, you know, separable and so on and so forth with the structure that you're using, but it has to have the two operations has to have its property. So it's a very nice paper to. Almost 10 years ago, that people were trying to extend dynamic programming to other structures and it came up. Because many of these other we're talking about are actually dynamic programming algorithms. Sorry. No, that's, that's good. And the thing is, all I wanted you to see is a really simple example where left, right, and global are all different. So I think that's what I wanted this example to show, and uh, I'm sorry I was confused. In this particular example, is this, a re is this maybe in practice a result of peering versus transit agreements? Okay, I'll get to that. Okay, okay thanks. So now, interdomain routing with BGP. It's called, the Border Gateway Protocol is a protocol that has evolved organically in the interdomain space of the internet. That is, it connects together today about 40,000 independent networks in the internet. and. Uh, you know, it's, it's essentially at the top of the routing food chain in the internet. And it really has evolved organically, you know, by essentially expedient tax. As the, as the <coughs> internet was commercialized, as the operator community sort of started to figure out, solve their problems, as Cisco worked with them to do that, and as the IETF responded to this environment. And it, it evolved without a lot of uh, theory behind it. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I know some. Of, I've met some of the uh, designers of BGP, and they really think that BGP is the shortest path uh, protocol. It isn't.
But that's okay. You know, and actually, in some ways, it's really good that they blundered into this because, you know, had they asked the uh, theoreticians back in the early 90s, well, here's what we want to do, the theoretician probably would have said, you can't do that. Right. It'll break. It's wrong. It's an end. And so the fact that they <laughs> sort of didn't know what they were doing allowed them to develop this very, very expressive routing policy that was able to adapt to the commercial internet. Okay. And that's a good thing. And the, the, the problems that it causes, which I'll talk about, are not so serious uh, that uh, they can't be half around. Okay. So anyway, it uh, has complex policy and metrics. I won't really go into the details, but the primary uh, requirement, and it really wasn't a requirement in, in the sense it's more of an, the environment it grew up in, is that you have to be able to implement routing that respects the economics of you know, uh, peering in transit and, and customer provider. In other words, the basic idea is, if you're one of these 40,000 networks in the global internet, if traffic is going across your network, you want either the source or the destination of that traffic to be from somebody that's paying you for the use of your network. Right? Otherwise, you're giving bandwidth and resources away for free. Okay. That's really the fundamental idea. Uh, okay? And so, at a very high level, there are two things going on with, with BGP. Um, there's the economic stuff, what I just told you about. So, if we could solve that problem, solve the economic relationship, then within those paths that satisfy the economic relationships, then you can do traffic engineering. You know, shortest paths or best paths by whatever uh, criterion you want to use. So, so think of BGP at a high level as economics plus traffic engineering. And economics is more important. Okay. And they implemented it in, in BGP as a lexicographic choice, essentially. There's an attribute that, that, that pretty much encodes, although the protocol doesn't say this, it pretty much in, in, the, pre, in the way it's used today, it pretty much encodes the economic relationship. That's considered first, and then the traffic engineering attributes are considered, okay? So, um, and, and furthermore, uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce a really simplified version of what goes on in the internet. Usually people call this the Gao-Rexford model, um, but for Alicia and Gao and Jennifer Rexford, uh, wrote some papers in the early maybe 2000 about this. Um, so basically, here's the idea. You have a route. Uh, you're an internet service provider. You have a, a route. Well, it's, it's maybe one of three types. It's either from a customer or it's from a provider. So a customer is paying you for connectivity to the internet. Or it's from a provider. You're paying them for connectivity. Or it's from what are called peers, competitors that you share routes with. Okay? And you may share routes with them because you're top of the food chain, like AT&T, and you have to, you're offering. What service are you offering? Global connectivity. Wow, AT&T has to interconnect with Sprint. Even though they don't like to, they have to. Okay? Or if you're further down in this food chain, uh, you know, you're paying lots of upstream bandwidth charges, so maybe you get together with your competitors to, to share customer traffic so that you both reduce your upstream bandwidth charges, you introduce little shortcuts in the hierarchy. That's very common. Okay? Uh, so, and normally, uh, you look, and as I say normally here because where, wherever you look at any, any internet service provider I've looked in, this is a good starting point to understand what they're doing, but then you see all sorts of variations on this theme. But you say, ah, customer, they're paying me, I better like them, right? I better take these routes before any other route. Because you don't want a customer calling and saying, well, what's going on with my connectivity? And they, you say, well, I'm not using your route. I'm using a route through one of my competitors to get to you. <laughs> They'll switch to that competitor pretty quickly. Okay, so uh, peering, you, then you go here, and it, this is the last one, because you, they're charging you. They're metering you. Right? And, and you, you don't want to use those unless you have to. Okay, so that's, that's that. And then you have this basic route visibility problem, which is probably, if you 
think about it, it's sort of the primary source of non-distributivity, but not the only source. Let me just tell you how this goes. Your peer, uh, so this peer is going to send routes to this peer. They're competitors, remember. So it's going to send all of its customer routes over there, or some subset of customer routes. But it's not going to send any of its peer routes. Because if it did, this guy just sees peer routes. He can't tell where they came from. And it would start sending traffic. And this guy would transit traffic to this guy's customers, which may not be its customers. And that could come from customers over here, which are not its customers. So it's giving bandwidth away for you. The same goes for if it took its provider routes and handed them over there. This guy would say, oh, I've got a free shortcut to uh, at and I'll use it. So no. So you notice every route that comes uh, from this peer to that peer has the same essentially economic component, right? And so all the all these things are just going to differ on the traffic engineering stuff. So it could be that in the traffic engineering domain, these routes look better than these routes for some reason. Uh, okay, and that's that's an example of of no distribution there. Uh, the other one is the other simple one to describe is, uh, in other words. This guy could be, uh, if I could get this route, I would like it, but I can't get it uh, because it's being hidden by my neighbor. Okay. Um, it's filtered, uh, so there's something going on here. The routes are actually being filtered out, uh, turned into infinity in, in the algebraic sense. Okay, so I'm a customer and uh, uh, of this provider, and um, I'm going to send up some routes to that provider. I'm not going to send my provider routes or my peer routes. The same reason, right? Because uh, providers prefer customers. So, I mean, actually, this kind of thing happens. It used to happen more often than it does today. But in the 90s, people would, customers would accidentally send all of their routes up to their provider. And because providers prefer customers over everybody else, they will like happily route through you know Jack's Internet Bar every destination in the internet. This happened many times in the, as the internet was being commercialized, uh, and then people started putting in the filters and realizing, oh, wow. And now, now uh, this provider puts in filters here to protect itself from the routes that this guy might accidentally send it. Uh, so there's lots of details there. Basically, these are the sources of uh, non-distributivity. The other thing is, so if you're a customer and you're getting all these provider routes, right? Everything is a provider route. Right? It doesn't matter whether it comes from your your provider's customers or peers or your provider's providers. Right? Everything looks to you like a provider route. So based on, uh, there's no guarantee that your notion of uh, traffic engineering is going to be consistent with your provider's notions of customer peer provider and so on. So just to give you an idea that you know the reasons we lack non-distributivity here are not because of some stupidity. That actually in this domain it doesn't make sense to talk about globalized math. What it, you know you can't even if you, globally optimal paths don't make sense in this in this world. Right. How, and how could you expect AT&T and Sprint to agree on any metric? Okay. So this is an interesting uh, environment where the only this notion of left local optima makes sense. Uh, okay. So, but this didn't. It wasn't. It didn't. This didn't become obvious. Uh, it took several years for this to sort of crystallize into into a, a nice story that I'm telling you. It's because. The, the uh, domain-specific details are kind of overwhelming, um, but I'm hopefully ignoring most of those. So, Bellman Ford, when can we compute these left local optima? And that, what I mean by Bellman Ford is any implementation of this sort of iterative matrix multiplication. And there are many variations on the details of what it, you know, so I, I'm really talking about a family of algorithms. And I'm being a little sloppy. I, so first thing we have to do in the non-distributive case is to augment the algorithm to keep track of paths. Because I, I'm not, I can't consider in this iterative thing any paths that have a loop in them. 
And the reason is that you may have known for, for example, for shortest path distributed Bellman forward, let's say RIP protocol, there's something called counting to infinity. And that happens when the network changes its state and it's no longer consistent with the current uh, uh, configuration. And then what you can just sort of, you can, you, you have to spend a lot of time flushing this old information out of the system. That can, can last a long time. It can go to infinity, actually. RIP's solution is make infinity equal 16. Uh, so you don't have to wait that long. Uh, anyway, in these non-distributed things, you can run into that counting to, uh, counting to infinity problem when you start from scratch for an I. Why? In, in the distributive case, every time you do this iteration in the distributive case, somebody gets better. Nobody gets worse, right? Every, the, there's a partial order on these matrices, and it always gets better. Somebody's getting better until you convert, right? In the non-distributive case, some guys are getting better, some guys are getting worse, some guys are getting better, some until you converge. Do. And that's what makes the mathematics of proving the, these results so much more difficult. Because it's not a monotonic function on these matrices. It's some weird thing. So the, I think the cleanest proof we have right now is an unpublished one by my former student, Alex uh, Gurney. And he uses an ultrametric uh, on these matrices. And he uses some fixed, so we're, we're trying to find a fixed point of that matrix equation, right? So he uses some sort of non-standard fixed point theory with an ultrametric. And it works really nicely. And the nice thing about his proof is that there are some, there are some conditions that were developed by Bert Sikas and others. Um, if you have a certain kind of proof of synchronous stability, the same system will stabilize with very few assumptions in an asynchronous. Okay, and so that, that's a nice proof. That's, again, that's Alex Gurney. He's now doing a postdoc at UPenn. And uh, uh, so the point is that the proofs are hard. Okay? And we've gone through many different versions of these proofs. And I hope that someday the proof is going to be so simple it fits on one page and we're all going to go, oh, that's obvious. But right now it's still kind of uh, tedious. Um, but anyway. Basically, instead of distributivity, we need something like this inflationarity condition, or strict inflationarity. Uh, remember here in the min plus case, zero is infinity. So, uh, so in other words, uh, you always get, if, if min is, if, if less is better, then you always get worse as you extend it. That's what this says. And that's all you need uh, to get, uh, a, a unique left local optimum. And then the point is the device are not the same, right? Yeah, but I'm also going to, do I assume, ah, notice that I assume the selected monoid. What I mean by that, sorry, I didn't define it, is A plus B is either A or B. Okay. So it's a total order. Okay. Open question. We don't know how to extend this result to partial orders. Okay. We don't know. Uh, it's kind of unexplored territory. Because uh, we are into the same condition when we're studying orders. So, uh, so just take that uh, on faith that we can actually do that. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties of the proof. I could do that during the two weeks here. I could go through various versions of the proof. Um, but uh, uh, let me just say it this way. Another way of saying this. If you look at the big, if you look at the graph, and you think about the relationship that, that paths have with one another. Um, this path is a subpath of that path. There's a relationship there. It's essentially a, a nice uh, a DAG kind of relationship. And then you impose on that graph relationships that have to do with violations of monotonicity. I'm sorry, distributivity. Right? These things, this, these conditions guarantee that there are going to be no cycles in the resulting structure. And then that, that uh, iteration that I showed you is somehow walking around that tree. 
That's basically what all the proofs look like. Not true. I'm sorry. Walking around that that graph, and the only way you can get into a problem is if there's a cycle. That's that is it's also the same condition you need one of the conditions you need for hop by hop loop freedom, right? It's just so it's kind of a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, because I'll show you. Uh, so okay, so just as how did we even get started on this? In, right? If BGP worked properly, I never would have looked at it. So the reason we looked at it, of course, is that BGP doesn't satisfy these properties, and bad things can happen. You know, the protocol can diverge when no solution exists. There are cases of this happening in the wild. Okay, uh, the protocol may diverge even when a unique solution exists. Okay, now uh, that's because BGP doesn't obey these. These restrictions, yeah. Well, okay. So the distributed Bellman four will converge, will stop exchanging routes, only when it finds a solution to that equation. And if there is no solution, it just keeps exchanging messages forever. This happens. Now, I personally think this isn't the big problem. Uh, I think the the real operational problem is captured in this RFC called BGP wedges, and that is your policies you've written down, your, your, you publish them to your customers, let's say, they have semantics, but there are solutions of the system that violate those, the, mean, the intended meaning of your routing policies. Okay? Is that related to what people were writing about them? BGP instability is more of the first two situations. Yeah. So this is something that, uh, okay, I must admit I'm an author on this RFC, and I must admit that I invented the term BGP. Because I'm kind of a juvenile at heart. Uh, but the reason is the system gets wedged, and the only way to fix it is manual intervention. But we're in a situation where, oh, maybe I didn't mention, providers don't share their policy information. It's proprietary. AT&T does not, you, if you want to look at their policies, at their scripts, or at that, their, their routing policies, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And so you run into these bugs that can only be debugged globally, but no one's sharing policy. And the, the, the reason I wrote that with Jeff Houston is that at AT&T I saw this happen. And people didn't understand it very well. I wasn't able to talk about the details of what I saw up there. Um, but it happens because what's happening today is I, I should have said maybe there's there's a there's a game in town where people put little marks on their on their routes and then interpret them. So AT&T will say, put a purple mark on your route, and I will guarantee that it's a backup route. I will only use it if it's the only thing left in the internet. So that's an example things they do. And it's very easy to get into these kind of situations where there's traffic coming in on their backup link, on their main link as well, and they call up AT&T and say, I put the purple color on there, but you're still sending me traffic. And if you're lucky, you can debug it locally. If you're unlucky, you can't do anything. Uh, so that's really insidious, and I think it's happening more and more as policies get more and more complex. Now, what I'm going to, I don't have time to say, to go into details, but I'll say it really quickly, is that Dijkstra's algorithm can be used to find right local solutions. Okay? For non-distributed, totally ordered algebras, which was kind of a surprise. This is paper that uh, Joan Sobrino and I had last summer at uh, MTNS. Uh, and uh, this is just a general version of Dijkstra's algorithm. But so, uh, and of course if you need, if you need uh, a left local solution, you can always use, you can always do some transposing, use Dijkstra's 
essentially n times, right, to solve uh, this uh, thing in polynomial time and then, and then unravel it. That this answered an open question that we had was, what's the complexity of solving these equations? Because I, maybe I didn't mention it, but for the Bellman-Ford iteration, we still have no bound. And how, we know that the iteration will terminate, we have no bound. So we were like, oh, there has to be a polynomial. We wanted a polynomial time uh, bound on the solving the problem. And it turns out you can do it with Dijkstra's algorithm, which was a huge surprise to us. Uh, and also, it's a little bit more um, relaxed. We don't have that strict inflationarity anymore. And so we only need that uh, it's just inflationary, uh, which is kind of fun. Anyway, so. Here's the takeaway message that I want you to remember. If you have uh, an algebraic uh, system that you're modeling and it's not distributive, consider a left or right local optima, and maybe they will make sense in your, for your problem. And uh, in that case, you can use Dijkstra's algorithm with some care. Uh, now, I just want to mention a couple of open problems. Again, I, I still... <laughs> I think if we could solve this, how many iterations of Bell before that, we'd get some insight into these problems a little bit. Uh, because, uh, you know, that's still a, a, an interesting algorithm, especially in a distributed environment. Uh, and I'd like to know uh, the answer to that. I'd also like an equational axiomatization of this, of this local optimality. And in the, in the global optimality case for semi-rings, we have Kleene algebras, which for, which gives you an equational way of reasoning about these things. And that not only gives you insight into the system, but allows you to do a lot of automated theorem proof. Right? Because it's equational. Theorem, automated theorem proofers are really good at equations. Well, they're better at equations than anything else, let me put it that way. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention much of, I've been just talking about the algebraic stuff, but I, there's this fascinating problem that comes up in the inter-domain space. You've got a distributed Bellman Ford with hard state. That is, everybody remembers everything their neighbors tell them. You know, and if the system settles down, you, you never exchange routes again. Suppose that every route became stable in the internet. Well, then every, every peering of BGP would just be exchanging, hello, hello, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. No routes would be exchanged. Well, these systems have really strange dynamic behavior things do change, right? So if you just do the straightforward implementation of distributed development forward with a hard state, you get exponential number. With slight little changes, you get a huge number of updates, just overwhelming the network. So all sorts of hacks have put, been put into BGP to dampen this kind of essentially, essentially, it's induced by the lack of global knowledge, really. In some ways, uh, you're, you're exploring paths and flushing things through the network. And the thing is, it's all hacked. We don't have a good model of the dynamics uh, of this protocol. You'd like to be able to say, ah, you know, to, to dampen this kind of oscillation, do this, and you're guaranteed that the network will never collapse under, uh, because of, you know, routing storms. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting sort of dynamical systems problem. Uh, and as far as I know, we don't have a clue on how to start that, solving that problem. But maybe, maybe you have some ideas. And I'm sorry I went over time. Thank you very much. solution makes sense because of hop by hop forward for one. And the other is I can't make any sense of global optima in this domain. Yeah, but that's I mean, it's reasonable. So anytime I cannot make sense of the global optima, it's reasonable to Oh it's real okay so I meant oh I'm sorry. I mean, what I, I meant in general here right? what I meant in general here is if you have a problem where the solution, the stable uh, the stable path solution 
you're, there has to be some sort of consistency of each node with the paths at its neighbors. There's a, some sort of local consistency. That makes sense for your problem. It could be some sort of uh, material distribution problem. Let me show you an example in networking. Suppose you can build tunnels that hop over your, your neighbor. That your neighbor doesn't actually inspect the network address that you're using. You've, you've encapsulated it in a tunnel. You can tunnel through your neighbor and use a globally optimal path, even though it, it's not the path your neighbor is using. Yeah. Another answer to your question is because you have to pay attention to the So it's not the single metric. No, no, but that's what I was listening. I, mean, I was waiting for you to drop the dime on the economics. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So the, the what do you say you talked about is that because the policies are globally stable or solvable, or is it because of um, uh, like inherently there's some of, the, some of the policies they're trying to implement aren't there's no global solution for them, or is it because they're not uh, implemented uh, it, within their own network? Uh, the, the basic problem is. BGP, the system itself, is not doesn't guarantee that there exists unique local optimal. Okay. Sure. And then in this particular environment, we have different networks just implementing their own policies without talking to one another. And that's the problem that you have this interaction of policy that is not well understood. You know, my policies are interacting with yours, but we're not even coordinating. There's a lack, total lack of coordination between the, you know, they, they're being secretive about their policies rather than cooperating. That's the basic problem. And then, well, all bets are off, right? And if you do have these problems, like lack of convergence or multiple solutions, well, how are you going to debug it? Well, no, we have examples, I could talk about this, okay? We have examples where three internet service providers the only way to fix it is, okay, so two guys and the two service providers are having problems. There's a guy in the middle who's not having a problem, who has to reset a BGP session that's not even carrying traffic to fix the problem. Now, how are you going to get him to do that in the real world, even if people could have global knowledge and understand why they're seeing what they're seeing? So. Now, how to solve it, by the way, how to solve this in the global BGP interdomain world, I don't know, because I used to think that Cisco and the, the incumbents were interested in solving these problems. I don't believe that anymore. They're interested in maintaining legacy code. So this code is now where the telephone switch code was in the middle 90s. It's legacy code. They're going to milk it dry for as long as they possibly can. Why not? They have no interest in fixing these problems. They have an army of trained engineers out there that know how to fiddle this stuff, and it locks customers in, right? What's that? Consulting fees too. Yeah, they get, and so the thing is, that's why I want to present this in a way that you know, it's it's a general thing. There's, you know, no, kind should, of, there's no kind of balance in revenue coming from what you propose, so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. So, I have a question. Yes. Uh, people have talked about. Uh, Making measurements of one part of the internet and inferring things about it. Um, so, is it possible if I want to infer your policies? Yeah. And I'm one of those ISPs or whatever. Since we, since our physical links will over will be used. Uh, so, I, okay, I miss some, but I have others. Can I uh, make measurements on what I can measure and infer in an abstraction of what you're doing and using it to bypass the problems? Is that possible? Or not? Okay. So there is a widespread belief in the internet community that this is possible. I've never believed a single one of those papers. I hope nobody here has heard, you know, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. But uh, the thing is, you're seeing the output of policy. That's, you're seeing the output of an output. To infer what the, the code is, is very difficult. And you're always seeing... Uh, but I said that it's a different thing I asked. Can I infer a useful abstraction of what you're using to me that will an ecosystem? Well, that you can see, I mean, the thing is, what no, you can I bypass you or cannot? Because you, said, you see, the last thing you said is I cannot do it because if I'm trying to fix it and I'm not sharing, then I'm dead. But 
can I infer some useful things from what you're doing and then kind of bypass you? Or I'm stuck. This is it's, it's extremely difficult to infer anything. Uh, Even an approximation. Well, you Even can do some approximation. approximations, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get the data uh, complete because we have lots of data, but it's all incomplete. Uh, let me put it this way. I worked at at and for three years. We set up a lot of measurement in the network. There were many problems that happened in the network. This is one network. We had lots of measurement. Many problems happened that we could never figure out. So in what extent? So, why am I asking you to show you what extent? Because people make other claims. Okay, so I asked the wrong question before. I'm asking another wrong question now. Because I, I kind of guess from the previous answer the answer to this one. Is, the, is internet a, an example of a collaborative system or no? Uh, well, it has to be. I mean, in some ways it's collaborative because you even have to collaborate with your competitors to, to make the whole thing work. So it's this. It's a game of some kind. You know, there's a tension there. So this peering, and peering is a good example. I want to de-peer my peers because I want to turn peers into customers, right? Isn't that my, my incentive is to turn peers into customers? And so there's this constant battle of de-peering, you know, somebody de-peered so-and-so or, you know, because uh, basically you're peer with somebody if they have enough clout to say, to, to, to go into that negotiation and say, I'm not paying you. You know, we'll, we'll do this to help one another. And, the, and the, so those peering agreements are usually attached to contracts that are involved monitoring. And if things go out of bounds, then the thing automatically gets reconsidered, uh, let's say, or renegotiated. So these are, you know, so there's a game going on here, right? And it is quite an interesting one economically. And it all gets implemented in BGP, but it happens at layer 17. Any other questions? So thank you very much. So Professor Baby will be here for until November. November 10th he departs, right? So if you're interested in these things, if you want to learn more, please see him and watch out for some informal lectures we're going to have for some of the